Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, afternoon session, the first of several uh, today that you're going to uh, see from this particular venue. We're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, fatigue science uh, uh, initiatives that RAA has uh, put into place since the Coligan accident. But uh, Scott has uh, kindly uh, talk to me uh, and let me uh, shamelessly promote the Flight Safety Foundation for just a few minutes. Everyone's here promoting something uh, in one way or another and I want to promote the, uh, the foundation. So uh, Dr. Hans Van Dongen will be also talking here in just a few minutes. I'm going to do a little bit of a, an intro on him and a little bit of background on how we got to where we are today. So thanks for taking the time to be here. If you get your lunch, come on in, sit down. Uh, sit with us for a few minutes and listen, and uh, it, we'll hope that we uh, can get some more interaction as we move on this afternoon. First of all, just wanted to talk a little bit about the Flight Safety Foundation in general. This is our mission statement, and a lot of you don't really know exactly who the Flight Safety Foundation is. Many times we're confused with Flight Safety International, who is the training organization, and uh, my staff on a daily basis takes a lot of calls on how can I get training, who can train me on this, and what that's about, and we gladly give them the right telephone number because Flight Safety International is a member of the Flight Safety Foundation. But our mission is to pursue the continuous improvement of global aviation safety uh, issues and the prevention of, of accidents. And the Foundation's been in business since 1947. A man by the name of Jerry Letterer, Jerome Letterer, started the Foundation, and he came from an aviation insurance underwriter company. But his claim to fame was that he continued to put out a digest called the Flight Safety Foundation Air Safety Digest, which many of you saw all the way up until approximately 10 years ago when it changed over to now what our new publication is, which is the Aero Safety World. But what we really bank on is the fact that we are an independent, impartial, international and nonprofit organization. We can actually, as Bill Voss coined, and I agree, speak truth to the power. We are not a lobbying group. We're not an association group, but we are a group that brings the best practices of safety and tries to reduce the risk in aviation operations. We're made up of a lot of different various member groups, as you can see right here on this particular slide diagram. We have over a thousand members and uh, they come from all walks of life, everybody from regulators, air carriers, regional air carriers, other associations, the government, and our newest, uh, latest area, which is our student membership, which we're very proud of, because we're cultivating more students to come into the industry to actually backfill where all of us will uh, eventually leave and, and hopefully go fishing and enjoy the rest of our, our career. Uh, some of the activities that we take place are research, education, we advocacy, we facilitate a lot of projects. Some of the things that you're familiar with that we've done in the past is we've done a lot of good work in uh, CFIT, also done some great work now in uh, go-around, runway excursion type work, and even in the past, if you reach back, the Foundation's been a part of things since uh, the very beginning of aviation in terms of the basics like nav lights, radar, and uh, flight into unknown weather conditions. We also are in the publishing side with our magazine, but our website has just been recently redesigned, and I think you'll find it very user-friendly, and uh, there you can access uh, our Aero Safety World magazine about three months uh, out. Uh, in other words, the most recent edition is reserved for our, our members. After three months, then everybody gets that. We also look into the uh, corporate aviation support. We have a large business aviation contingency, and uh, we reach out to the media a lot. We're one of the few that can speak to the media right after an event happens and hopefully give them a perspective uh, that is relevant to the industry versus uh, solving the accident right there in the next 20 second soundbite. As I mentioned, here's our magazine, Aero Safety World. It came from the Aero Safety Digest and uh, it's estimated right now that we've got uh, monthly distribution both electronically and uh, in print uh, of a total of uh, 200,000 in Chinese and Spanish. 
Also, we're partners with Skybrary, which you uh, know comes from Eurocontrol, one of the best resource databases in the world to find out aviation information either happening now or in the past. So let's move on. Enough of the shameless presentation and the commercial break. We'll move right into what we're here to talk about today. Some of the issues and questions. You know, going back uh, to that event with the uh, Colgan accident, Flight 3407, uh, which was a Q400 back in February of 2009. That particular accident, besides having the normal response for looking at what caused the accident, began a lot of other questions to come out of this particular event. The actions even have a little bit of a global perspective. I had the uh, privilege this morning to talk with Simon McNamara, who is at the ERAA, and he's a member of our organization. And we talked a little bit about the accident this morning. They are working on it in more of the scientific terms, but they're not getting anywhere near the pilot qualification area that we tackled here in the United States with Congress uh, inserting their uh, opinion on how much flight time a first officer needs to have in the, in the cockpit of that aircraft. So the focus really between the United States and Europe, the commonalities come in basically the science of the fatigue that's been caused and focused on in this particular event. So you've got pilot qualifications that we look at. We're looking at duty time and we're looking at the training. Now, since that particular point, there have been a lot of symposiums that have been conducted, studies. The foundation's had its own symposium. MITRE has had one. There's been various other symposiums, not only here, but also in Europe. And they have actually outlined some of the items that came out of this particular accident. As we move forward, uh, one of the things that we found was uh, the United States Congress decided to insert itself in an area where was it necessary or not. And this has actually clouded some of the uh, actions that were taken after uh, the particular event. And I won't go into those today other than to say that we have to be extremely careful as we go forward because we've got Congress now deciding that they're going to do the job that the FAA is supposed to do. And the FAA actually did a good job. It's just a matter of the family assistance groups inserted into there, provided a lot of pressure. And when that happened, different angles of attack were made on this particular event. So the emerging questions that are coming up now are multi-segment operations. But we've not had any science to really look at that. Right in the aftermath of the accident, Roger Cohen uh, was interviewed by NPR. I'll closely, loosely say what he said in that particular event, but basically speaking, he said that the RAA will launch a scientific study uh, to research and address fatigue in a study format to look at performance of multi-segment legs of flying regional aircraft. The RAA has been very proactive in supporting this area, also nationwide and in uh, Washington. They also now have teamed up with Washington State University to go launch a particular study, which I think is just uh, very, very worthwhile and very forthcoming. They enlisted the help of uh, research professor Hans Van Dongen. Hans is up here with me on stage today. And I'm going to give you a little bit about his bio, and then we'll go ahead and have him give us his part of the presentation. But the research that he's done leads the Human Sleep and Cognition Laboratory, the Sleep Performance Research Center at Washington State University in Spokane. He's internationally known for his studies of cumulative cognitive deficits due to chronic sleep restriction, trait inter-individual differences in the vulnerability to fatigue, mathematical modeling of fatigue, and cognitive performance topics. His work is frequently cited and widely recognized in laboratory and operational settings. He's been awarded many research funding grants from institutions such as the National Institute of Health, the United States Air Force, United States Army, Navy, NASA, the FAA, 
Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the Transportation Safety Research Board, Transport Canada, and the Regional Airline Association. And the RAA study of workload fatigue and performance is what he has been working on. This has been for about three and a half years as a project. Today he's going to give us a focus on, again, the uh, segments of flying and uh, a five-leg day compared to a one-leg day. So with that, I'm going to get right onto the meat of our program and introduce Hans van Doggen, and he'll take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be talking to you here today. And um, what I'd like to do is, before I get uh, started and talk about the fatigue study, is give you a little bit of an introduction into what fatigue is all about, what we know about fatigue in terms of sleep science. And sleep science tells us that fatigue is determined by two major factors. The first is your prior sleep wake history. In other words, how much sleep did you get in the days beforehand and how long have you been awake? And the second major factor is what we call circadian rhythm or your biological clock, the time of day. Your brain has a biological clock inside that keeps track of time of day for your, for your brain, for your body. Um, and that uh, co-determines fatigue. And those two processes, so prior sleep-wake history and time of day, uh, they interact to determine your overall fatigue. During a normal day period, this, this works as follows. So the moment you get up, every hour you're awake, you start to build up a pressure for sleep. And that pressure gets greater with every hour that you're awake. But at the same time, your biological clock counteracts that pressure by producing a pressure for wakefulness. And these two pressures counteract each other and cancel each other out across the day as follows. So as the day progresses, you build up that pressure for sleep in the top graph, but at the same time, you build up that counter pressure for wakefulness from time of day from your biological clock. And the net effect is a more or less stable level of alertness through the, uh, the hours of the regular day. That's how it works in a person who, who is just normally active during the day and sleeps at night. I'm going to show you, sort of to, to make a counterpoint, what that looks like in a night shift worker. So now we're looking at the other side of the biological clock. And of course, the, the uh, time awake part works the same way. The more hours you're awake, the greater your, your pressure for sleep. But at night, the biological clock actually withdraws that pressure for wakefulness because you're supposed to be asleep during those hours. And so now those two systems no longer work in concert or work in, in, in counteraction, uh, but they work in, in, um, in synergy to make you sleepier with every hour of your nighttime period. And then at the end of the nighttime period, when people would drive home, and actually would uh, drive home, we get these, these uh, uh, fall asleep crashes because people are now uh, both fatigued because of the time wake as well as because of the time of day. Now I know that this does not pertain to pilots and I'll get to that in a minute. But the, 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 uh, the, crasher, the crashes that we see when people drive home are actually relevant because they're sort of the extreme version of what happens in the brain when it is fatigued. When it is fatigued, a brain becomes unstable. And the hallmark, the most important characteristic of a fatigued brain is that it will be there most of the time, but not always. It becomes unstable and thus unreliable. And it is precisely that feature that makes fatigue dangerous in operational settings. Because as we all know, incidents and accidents don't happen as in, in isolation. They happen as a cascade of events most of the time uh, of, of, of bad things that happen to line up. And humans are in the loop. Humans are part of the, of the, uh, of the system to, as, a, as a final safety valve to make sure that when all other systems fail, that we can jump in and, fix and, and save the day. But of course, when you have a fatigued brain, and if that fatigued brain at that particular moment in time is having one of these, what we call lapses of attention, one of these moments when it's not there, that's when that last safety valve also doesn't, doesn't help and you get into an accident. And this happens across all industries, all transportation modes, all 24-7 industries in the entire world is a, is a running theme and, and it's, a, it's a hot topic in all these modes of transportation and all these industries at the moment because they all experience the same thing. We've become so good at engineering the world around us that the one thing that keeps failing us if everything else for whatever reason fails anyway is the human being and we can't engineer that away. So we need to manage that. We need to manage fatigue and fatigue risk management therefore is a, is, is, a, is a final solution, a final engineering solution if you want as a commitment to safety. 
in all industries and all 24-7 operations. But it's a complex picture. Um, so I've told you a little bit about the biology, and that's in, in these, uh, on these slides here is in, um, in gray. We have that system that builds up a pressure for, for sleep when we're awake, and of course we dissipate that pressure when we're, when we're asleep, that's what sleep is for. And then there's that biological clock, that little wiggle thing there that oscillates between day and night, that produces a pressure for wakefulness when we're supposed to be awake during the day, withdraws the pressure for wakefulness at night, those systems interact and produce that level of fatigue as I described to you, and because of the brain instability have an effect on cognitive uh, impairment. But that's only part of the story. The rest of the story is determined by our environment. Okay, so an environment is in part, when, do we, when were we actually supposed to be working? So the duty hours, timing and duration, those, those, those uh, constraints determine not how the biology works, but when it's operative, right? When it's working. Because if we have to work at night or if we work late hours or have an early start or something like that, that determines the, the state of our biological clock and thus it co-determines fatigue. And then that fatigue interacts with the rest of the, of the environment to produce a relative risk of errors, incidents, and accidents. But there are many other factors. Now this slide here is one that I present at, the, um, uh, at, may, at meetings when I uh, work for, with the Navy. As uh, Kevin um, already mentioned, I get a lot of funding from the Navy because they're very interested in this topic as well. And so in the Navy, they recognize that there's many other factors that, that co-determine fatigue as well. And, and an important one to them is the sea state, how, how high are the waves. Um, the weather, of course, is an issue. Um, are there any distractions? Um, are, is, there, is there a high stress level? Are, are there illnesses on board? Um, what are the work demands? All those factors are co-determined fatigue at the same time. And of course, it's no different in, in aviation. The same principles, different stories, sea state is not relevant, but, but we've got weather, we've got uh, air traffic density, that's a factor, all these other factors play a role as well. And they co-determine the, 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 the risk of, of uh, errors, incidents, and accidents. And so what that means is that fatigue, although is a factor in the whole story, it's not the only factor, and we need to look at the whole picture, and that makes it complicated. Um, there is a, a little yellow box on the slides there for light. We sort of set that aside in my field because light has so many different um, uh, parts to play in this story. The most important one from, from where I stand in the field of sleep science is that it actually helps to synchronize the biological clock. This is how we get used to another time zone when we travel to another time zone. It also has a direct alerting effect. If you look into the bright sunlight, all of a sudden you're, you're, you perk up, you're more alert. And then the third factor that most of my colleagues in my field continuously um, fail to recognize, and it's so obvious, is light plays a key role in, in, errors, in, in the potential for errors because of what you can actually see. So um, that should be obvious. Um, so that's a factor we set aside. I'm not going to talk about light any further today, but it's, that's why it's in this diagram. The key issue, the last box that I haven't talked about yet, of course, is, is the countermeasures box. So the, the, the fatigue levels and the biology that drive that those come with us, are with us all the time. The environment is driven by the tasks that we're supposed to do. That's our job oftentimes, and so there's not a whole lot we can change there. But the one thing that we have under our controls is what kind of countermeasures do we throw at it? And the science of fatigue risk management is all about, in this complicated, complex context of the biology that the human brings to the table and the environment that comes with the job or the task at hand, what countermeasures can you then add to that situation to manage fatigue and make it a better uh, situation. So that's what fatigue risk management is all about. Now, in this context, and now going to, uh, to the heart of sort of the aviation issues, um, the FAA decided that it was time for a new rule, and uh, that rule needed to be circadian smart. What that means is it needed to take into account time of day, because after all, if we have a biological clock that determines uh, fatigue levels as a function of time of day, then it, goes to reason, it comes to reason that um, uh, duty hours and duty hour regulations should take into account time of day. And so they produced what is now known as Table B as part of their um, uh, 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 Part 117 uh, rule. Uh, and this is a prior version of that that is not the ultimate rule, but one that they proposed in 2010. They produced that they would regulate duty hours as a function of the time that you start your duty day. And I don't know if you can see the numbers in the table, it doesn't really matter, but what you should notice is that depending on what time of day you start, there is a different maximum duty hours that you can, uh, can work at um, in this table depending on the time. But the other thing you should notice 
is that there are columns, different columns here, and, and each column is for a different number of segments that you would fly. And so what the FAA incorporated in this table was the idea that if you work more flights, if you work, uh, have m multiple takeoffs and landings, that there is a, implicitly a, a higher workload associated with that, and that higher workload should come as a, with a cost of fatigue. And so the idea was that you should regulate duty hours not only on the basis of that biological clock, which we know and have science for it, but also on the basis of the workload. And for that, there was no science at the time. This was just an idea, it makes sense perhaps from a conceptual point of view, but as sleep scientists we said, we have no evidence for that. But there is, there is nothing in the, in the literature that says that that would be so. So that was recognized, and therefore in 2010 then, the, uh, the, the, the RAA, in, in conjunction with my university, Washington State University, decided to start a, a, a pilot fatigue study um, to address this science gap, to address this issue of workload, and what does it actually do in terms of fatigue. Now, when I say there was no science, that's actually a little bit of a lie. There was no science that the FAA knew about, but there was, in fact, some science that I, this is a data set that I collected at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was at, uh, in the period of 98 through 2005. And this was the only data set, and actually to this day, is the only data set uh, uh, freely available at this point in time that addresses this issue. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say that it still hasn't been published, so the FAA still officially doesn't have access to this data, but I'm showing it to you to make a point here. And the point is that there is, in fact, some evidence that the FAA didn't know about at the time, but there is, in fact, some evidence that they were on, 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 onto something because there is a cost of workload. This is a complicated study, and I don't have time to describe it to you, but what you should take away from this graph is that over 36 hours of sleep deprivation, so skipping a whole night and then skipping uh, uh, sleep all the way into the next day. Um, if you measure performance, and we measure performance here on a psychomotor vigilance task, I'll describe that to you in a little bit more detail later. What you should know about this graph is that upwards on the graph is higher fatigue. More lapses on the PVT means more, more of these state instabilities that are a hallmark of fatigue. So as you go through the 36 hours of sleep deprivation, in the blue curve there, you see a characteristic pattern of the two biological principles that I told you about. That the further in the, into this graph you go, the higher the fatigue levels because you're awake longer, but there is this change in the pattern due to the biological clock, which makes the fatigue the highest in the middle of the night, in the middle of the graph, and actually come down a little bit into the next day, which is when your biological clock is helping you out with new pressure for wakefulness. It's the sort of, uh, some people describe this as getting your second wind when you make it through the morning, early morning hours and you continue to stay awake. That's what you're seeing there. The red curve is what happened when we put additional workload on the subjects in this study. We made them work harder. And then when we tested their fatigue, lo and behold, we found that there was an increase in fatigue. Not a massive increase in fatigue, it's modest. But as time progresses and you were awake longer, that, that started to matter and started to accumulate. So there was, in fact, some evidence that workload makes a difference. But this was a lab study. It was a study that had circumstances that are quite different than what we see in the operational uh, world. It was to make a, a scientific point, but how do we know that any of this actually pertains to the operational environment? Well, the answer is, at, 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 when we started out in 2010 and this question came up, uh, that the FAA had this new table, that we had no idea whether this would pertain to the real world. But it was 2010, the Regional Airlines Association was confronted with this new rulemaking and asked me to, uh, to say something meaningful about it. And I said, well, <laughs> can't do, um, because this doesn't pertain to the real world, or at least I don't know for sure. And so what are we going to do here? And what we decided to do is just to, to look at um, uh, the, uh, the, the principles of the biology of fatigue, for which we actually have equations. We know these principles so well that we have mathematical models, mathematical models predicting fatigue. Um, to, to predict profiles like this. And I said, what I can do is I can take these lab data and I can put them into our existing models of fatigue and see if we can make a prediction of what might happen based on the data, on that, what little data we have. But you'll have to promise me that if we do that, then we'll later on, we'll need to take the, 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 um, uh, the, the principles into the real world or, or some version of the real world and see if those actually validate. Um, I know we don't have time for this right now, it's 2010, the notice of proposed rulemaking was just out, we needed to say something about this table, so we made an agreement that we would produce a model of fatigue, apply it to the ideas that the FAA wanted to implement in its new rules, but then keeping in mind that we needed to validate this. 
later on with the study. And I'm going to get to that study soon. But before I get there, let me show you what that model actually looked like that we produced. This is just an, uh, an example, a cartoon of what that would look like. Um, this is two days of, of flying. This is a made-up schedule from Philadelphia to uh, Montreal. I swear at the time we didn't know we were going to be in Montreal um, <laughs> at this point. This is pure coincidence. Um, and, and what this graph shows you here is in yellow we have a, 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 the period of, of pre-flight checks. Um, then uh, green is takeoff. Uh, blue is, is cruising en route. Um, red is a landing, and then there's a white is a break, and then the pattern repeats itself, takeoff, cruising, landing, a longer break, and then another takeoff, cruising, uh, landing, and so on. And, the, um, and then gray is a sleep period, and the blue line is, are the predictions of the mathematical model of fatigue as we had it at the time in 2010. And what you see is across the periods of takeoff and landing, which are high workload period, that the fatigue levels increase a little bit with every takeoff and every landing. And so that is what we then believe would be the cumulative cost of that additional workload as it uh, plays out in fatigue. Um, you see that going through the entire day up until we get into the late afternoon, just before that sleep period, and you get this paradoxical decrease in fatigue towards the, the, the sleep period. You see that there? Um, and that's actually the biological clock, which now is producing that maximum pressure for wakefulness. So uh, paradoxically, just before you go to bed, your biological clock is, is, is shouting the loudest it can that you should be awake. If you ever wondered why it is that if you go to bed early, earlier than you normally would, and, you, and you're in bed, nothing happens, that's because your biological clock tells you that this is good, you're not supposed to sleep yet. So that's that, that effect you see there. But then when you finally do go to bed, you, you see that blue line, you see that uh, uh, decrease, and that's sleep helping you get rid of that fatigue. Right? And then, the, and then add the rest of the graph just repeats the pattern to make the point. So that's the mathematical model that we had. And what we did is we applied it to what the FAA wanted to, uh, to regulate in its table B. And there was a particular question that there was um, at the time was that the aviation rulemaking committee that had proposed ideas to the FAA in, as part of its rulemaking had actually come up with a quite different version of that table B. And there were some important differences that were relevant in particular to the, uh, to the regional airline community. Um, because what the FAA wanted to do is in early oil starts, when typically when commuter airlines start, start running their business, they would have to much shorter duty periods than the ARC had originally recommended. And of course, this was um, both a scientific and a productivity issue. And the question came, who's right? Who's actually, whose recommendation is the best? The original ARC recommendation or the changes that the FAA made subsequently? And so we, we set out to use our model and, and say, make predictions on what we thought based on the science that we had available at, the, and on, at, at that time, um, uh, what, what we thought might happen in the, in the situation as the FAA had proposed it and then as the ARC had originally proposed it. And you see that illustrated for one particular case here in these graphs. We're talking about a start time of 5 o'clock, uh, six segments. The FAA said you can fly 9.5 hours maximum duty time. And the ARC had originally recommended 11 hours. And what happens is if you spread that period of, of duty over 11 hours, you actually start running into the uh, later afternoon hours. And once again, that's the period when the pressure for wakefulness from the biological clock is, getting, is starting to reach its maximum. So it's actually very difficult late in the afternoon to fall asleep even if you wanted to. And the, and the fatigue predictions of the model uh, uh, bore that out. Um, and, and what you can see is that in the 11 hour duty period, if you spread out the, the, uh, the segments a little bit more, you actually get a little bit lower fatigue predictions than in what the FAA had originally proposed. So in other words, what, this, what, what modeling like this was, was telling us that that particular um, uh, shortening of the duty period that the FAA had proposed was overly restrictive, wasn't helping anybody in terms of, uh, of fatigue. Now, I, I will say it again that there is, of course, a lot more to what determines fatigue than just um, uh, just the biology of, of, of sleep and wakefulness, but at least from that point of view, there was no reason, at least on, based on the science that we had in the day, to assume that the FAA made a good judgment in restricting that duty period because it didn't seem that that would help to curtail fatigue in the way they had intended it to. So the FAA actually thought that our arguments like this were, were rather convincing, um, and they, um, they revised their table B back to the original version that the ARC had proposed. And in, in this table, it's only filled in partially. Those are the cells in that table that were different between the FAA's proposal and what the ARC had originally recommended. 
and all the cases that are highlighted in green is where the FAA decided to say, fine, we agree with you, we're gonna reduce that, we're gonna change that table back to what the ARC had proposed. So that was, a, was a, a, I think, a useful result, but remember, we still had to validate that mathematical model. And to do that, we set out to do a simulator study. And the, and the whole idea of doing a simulator study was if you want to know what is the workload cost, what is the fatigue cost of a multi-segment day compared to a single segment day, where it's, where it's the minimum number of, of, of takeoffs and landings you can have, you're gonna to have to make it so that it's, it's, it's perfectly comparable. But that's very difficult to do in a real world environment because nobody can fly a single segment day that somehow miraculously becomes identical to a multi-segment day without the additional takeoffs and landings. So we figured doing this in the real world is not gonna help. We're not gonna be able to pull this off. Doing this in the lab is not gonna work because then the work won't be anything what a pilot will do. So we'll go to the simulator because in the simulator we can create an environment that is precisely that of what a, a pilot would do on a normal day, but we have full control over the circumstances. So what you see in this graph, in this, in this slide here, is the simulator that we use. It's the CRJ-200 simulator. Uh, this one was uh, located in the US Airways uh, Trading Center in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's the one that Air Wisconsin uh, uses, and Air Wisconsin has been uh, tremendously helpful in helping us pull off this study by making uh, pilots and other resources available. And the bottom graph, you see one of their pilots. This is for a photo opportunity. This was not one of our actual volunteer pilots, but it was just to sort of make the point of what they were doing there. They were flying the, flight, the, the, the simulator just like they would normally fly a revenue flight. It was like that in every possible respect. With one exception that every, uh, after every takeoff, when they reached top of climb, and after every landing, just before they pulled into the gate, we had them do a 10-minute reaction time task to measure their fatigue. And again, I'll get to that uh, later. But other than that, they flew it exactly like a revenue flight. We went to, to great lengths to make this realistic. We created, we created jet charts for the airports as they were modeled in the simulator um, so that the, uh, the, the charts would look exactly like what the pilots actually saw on, on the, uh, in, the, in the windshield uh, area of the, um, of the cockpit. Um, we had uh, created releases that would make the flights exactly like they would be in the real world if you would fly those particular flights. Um, we had pilots walk around the simulator to pretend that they were walking around their plane to inspect it. Uh, that took a little bit of imagination, but we pulled that off. Um, and so on and so on. Our pilots went to, to, the, to a briefing room to, to pretend that that was a gate where they would pick up their uh, releases and that kind of stuff. All those things were simulated exactly like it was a real airport, like it was a real plane, like it was a real flight scenario. Um, the, the, the number of steps is, the, of, that we took to, to make this happen is, is endless and I'm not gonna elaborate, but I do want to point out that there was a scientific steering committee that oversaw all of this that consisted of two independent scientists. I think in the end we found that we were the, use, the least useful in making this happen because we know the least about the, uh, uh, this kind of an environment. Um, so that was myself and that was Lynn Coldwell that, uh, who works at the US Navy. Um, then there were three representatives of Air Wisconsin and there were also three representatives of the Air Wisconsin uh, MEC and, and Alpa National, one of which was a, 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 a scientist consultant. Um, and then there was uh, one representative of the Regional Airlines Association, Scott Foos, who's in the audience here. And I see some of the people that helped us out there in the back of the, um, of the audience as well. I'm really glad you're here. Um, tell you a little bit more about that study. What we had people, uh, uh, volunteer pilots do is actually, and, and, and first of all, these, these pilots were drawn randomly from the um, uh, line holder community, uh, the line holder pilots of the Air Wisconsin community. And uh, uh, 24 participants actually were in the study, 12 captains, 12 first officers. Um, and you see that in the bottom, you see their qualifications there. So uh, obviously the captains had higher uh, number of uh, uh, flight uh, hours experience than the first officers. In green, you see their overall experience. In, in blue, you see the CRJ-200 experience. Um, I believe that these numbers are sort of a cross cut of what the uh, pilot population actually looks like there. Um, and each of these pilots, in each of these crews, was uh, deadheaded into the, uh, the, the simulator site, which was, uh, again, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and that was day one of a pairing, of a four-day pairing that they signed up to uh, voluntarily. And then on day two, they got up at around four o'clock, took the, uh, uh, the first shuttle from the crew hotel to the, to the training center, reported for duty at 5.15, and then flew either the multi-segment day 
or the single segment day. And what these days exactly look like, I'll show you in a minute. And then they flew a nine hour duty day and then went back to the crew hotel. Uh, the next day, they showed up again at the uh, simulator center. And this time, if they had flown a multi-segment duty day, then they would now fly the single segment duty day. And if they had flown the single segment duty day on the first day, then they would now fly the multi-segment day. And then lastly, on day four, they did head back home to their, to their domicile uh, and had a rest day. Um, throughout this entire period, we, man we monitored these pilots' sleep-wake patterns with a wrist activity monitor. That's that thing you see there on the wrist. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we call it an actigraph. It measures activity and rest patterns, and it gives us a really good reading of people's sleep-wake patterns. So we knew exactly what these pilots were doing. Hans, can I ask one question? Absolutely. As we go along? Was there any type of uh, consideration given for the age of the pilot? Um, we, so they were randomly selected. I know that they were, on average, 32 years old. Um, I know the range too, but I don't know that by heart. Um, but we, we took them as they came. So they were randomly picked. And so we had a nice representation of what the, uh, uh, what the uh, population looked like. But we didn't specifically select them as such. Like an old guy like me versus a young guy like next there, to me. There right? were some not so old guys like you there too. Okay, good. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. So let me take you through what we had them actually do. Um, I know this is a complicated graph, so let me walk you through it. Each of these brackets that you see there is either a, a takeoff or a landing. And so in a multi-segment day, the pilot started in St. Louis and then flew to uh, Springfield. And so they had a, a takeoff in St. Louis, the, a period of cruise, and then they had a landing in, in Springfield. Then there was a break, uh, uh, a turn, and then they um, uh, started a out in Springfield, of course, then flew to Dallas. That's, they landed in Dallas. Then there was a plane swap. We had uh, done some research in front, uh, up front and asked ourselves how often times does it actually happen because plane swaps are, are part and parcel of the, uh, of the business. And so we wanted to build that in. It turned out on average this happens once in a, uh, in a duty day. Of course it varies, but on average it's once a day. And so we put one plane swap in there. And, and actually then what we did is we had the pilots leave the, the simulator. We then put new numbers on the simulator as if it was a new plane and then they would come in and check it in again as if, they were, as if it was their first flight of the day, just as they normally would. So we had real realism even in that aspect. Um, so Dallas, they went into Corpus Christi. From Corpus Christi, they went to Houston. And then from Houston, they ended up in Little Rock. And then that was the end of their duty day, and, and they, they, they checked out. And nine hours later, they had completed that duty day. They would then also fly a sing the next day, or the day before that, they would fly the single segment day and I think that was perhaps the most challenging one because they started out with a takeoff in Miami. It took a little longer to get to altitude because that was, they were going to fly higher. Um, and then they were in the simulator for eight hours straight. I think that was the, the a major feat uh, to have them do that. And, and they all beautifully did. Um, and then ultimately they ended up in Seattle, landed there. And then also that completed a nine hour duty day. So everything is the same between these two scenarios with except for the multiple takeoffs and landings in the multi-segment day compared to the single segment day. Now the little yellow bullets that you see in that graph there were the times when we had to do them, had them do that psychomotor vigilance task, that 10 minute reaction time task that we measure fatigue at with. And I wanted to show you an example of a record that we get from such a, uh, from such a, a task. And it's, so it's a 10 minute task, so 600 seconds. And every two to 10 seconds, you see a stimulus pop up on the screen. It's a millisecond counter, actually. It starts at zero, very rapidly, of course, increases. And your job is simply to press the button and stop that counter. And when you do that, what you see on the screen is your millisecond reaction time, OK? That stays on the screen for a second for you to watch it. And then it disappears. And two to 10 seconds later, it pops up again unexpectedly. And you press the button to stop it. You do this for 10 minutes, a very simple task, one of the hardest tasks you can ask a brain to do. And if we ever figure out why it's so hard, we'll probably get a Nobel Prize for that. I'm telling my students this all the time. Um, uh, but we don't know it just yet. But we know that it is, uh, what this task does is it exposes that instability that is the hallmark of fatigue. And you can see that in a record there. But this was actually from a, a person who's been awake for two days and two nights, uh, just to make you the point. And you see these, these spikes in reaction times. Those are those instabilities. That's what we're looking for. Now, I can tell you, we didn't see anything like this in the pilots that participated in the study. First of all, they weren't that severely sleep deprived. And secondly, uh, I don't know what it was about them, but they just didn't lapse that much. <laughs> um, they did 
show a difference between uh, what it was like to fly a multi-segment day and a, and a single segment day. I'm going to be very brief about this because the scientific steering committee is still vetting these results. I don't want to be uh, uh, sort of be uh, early in, 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 in disclosing these results without knowing for sure that they're final. Um, but there was a small difference in, in, in multi-segment versus single segment. Most importantly, we compared that difference to the mathematical model that we had produced previously because remember the purpose of this study was to make sure that our mathematical model would be validated. And it turns out that our, at least in, in, in broad strokes, the mathematical model that we had produced was in, in, uh, and the results that we actually got were in, in accordance with each other. So, so that suggested, again, this is a preliminary result, uh, but that suggested that the mathematical model that we had put together at least got the basic principle of that workload effect and how it affects fatigue. We got that at least in, in broad strokes, we got that right. So that was a good step. And that, that, that means that if we refine that a little bit more, that we will have a tool, a mathematical modeling fatigue prediction tool, that will at some point be useful for operations such as multi-segment operations that's of the type that regional airlines typically fly. Now, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to take this to the next level. And that's, that's uh, what we call phase three of this study, is really putting this into a broader context. Um, and, and, and talk about fatigue risk management and how would you implement fatigue risk management in a multi-segment operational context. And uh, we're still at the beginning stages of that. And I don't have any ready answers for you, but I have some ideas. And some of that I'm going to steal from something that has already been done in the industry uh, with the ultra-long range operations. Because the ultra-long range operations, a number of years ago, were confronted with the idea that all of a sudden we could fly more than 16 hours. And if you do the math with me, if you've got eight hours maximum uh, flight time, you have two pilots. If you've got 12 hours, uh, then you're going to go uh, for, for, uh, past eight to 12, you go to, two to three pilots. From 12 to 16, you go to four pilots. Therefore, after 16 hours, you would need a fifth pilot on board. And when that became, of, I mean, everybody could do the math there, but when that became a reality, that became all of a sudden very expensive to fly a multi, uh, uh, an ultra long range flight. And so the question was, is it really more fatiguing at the time? So this is a different context now, but it's, was it really more fatiguing to fly beyond 16 hours than it is to fly uh, uh, between 12 and 16 hours? And do you really need that fifth pilot and does it really actually help to promote safety? And so at the time, this is not a workload issue, but this is just a duration, a staying awake issue. They, they applied a mathematical model and said, well, here in, in yellow is what the long range flights uh, come out with as, as, as the level of fatigue that you would have in the hour of arrival, basically the time, the critical phase of flight when you're descending. And this is on a, a model that, that goes on the scale from zero to 100. 100 is maximum alertness. If you go lower on that scale, then you've got fatigue. And, and you see that there's a, uh, a variety of, 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 of numbers of fatigue in that hour of arrival in these flight schedules that were actually flown at the time, uh, as predicted by the mathematical model. Those are the yellow, orange uh, bullets. And then they had the schedules that they proposed they would fly for the ultra-long range operations. Those are in red. And they said, if we predict those out, then they sit right in the middle of those orange uh, bullets. They're very similar. Um, so these are flights that are at least 10% of the time 16 hours or longer ultra-long range, therefore, but their fatigue levels, as predicted by the mathematical model, are really no different than what we see in the long-range operations. And since the long-range operations have been historically safe, there's never been a single accident with any of the flights that are in this graph, then the, the idea would be that the ultra-long range, at least from a fatigue point of view, at least from a biological fatigue point of view, would be equally safe, if not safer, than the long-range flights, and so therefore, why would you need that fifth pilot? And as we've seen before, the, the FAA took that reasoning and said that's a credible argument. If you can provide us with data to support that, then we will take you up on this idea and we will, we, we will strike that fifth pilot as a, as a requirement. And that's what the, um, uh, the, uh, the airlines that were involved in this study, that was at the time was Continental, uh, American and Delta, uh, they teamed up, collected the data, showed that they were right, that these predictions were right and then got the FAA convinced that this was uh, a reasonable argument and, and it subsequently became implemented. This is the same way we can go with the regional airlines op operations. We can take the mathematical model, make an argument to the FAA for things that we would like to see happen or, or change or whatever it is, collect the data to support that argument, and then at least the way it looks right now, the FAA will then will take the data into consideration and if it's credible, they will make changes or, or make uh, 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 recommendations in accordance with what the data show. 
So it's a good time to be in, for, at least for me and, and from, I think for, for the uh, community as a whole, uh, where data actually start to make a difference. You collect the data, you can show that your case is valid, it will make a difference. I think that's an exciting new development. So with that, I want to take you one step further into what I think will be the future, ultimately, and leave it at that. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you something you already all know, that the aviation industry here is, is an extremely complex environment where lots of different factors have to come together to make it work. Um, if you want to run an operation, whether it's small or big, you need to get the right pilots with the right equipment, with the right kind of fuel, with the right kind of supplies, with the right kind of crew, with the right kind of passengers, all at the same place at the same time to be able to fly an operation. And this is a tremendously complex optimization problem, right? To run an operation like that efficiently, you have to solve many different uh, constraints and equations. And of course, there is software out there that, that the most carriers use that helps you do the to do that job and do it well. So how can you run an efficient operation, ask the computer, throw in all the constraints, and see what the best schedules that it, that it might produce, what they look like. So given that that's such a complex uh, thing to do already anyway, the idea has come up that adding fatigue as an additional constraint, making it so that, that fatigue is minimized in these operations, is really not a big extra deal. It's only just one more constraint about, uh, of about 100 or so that are already in there. And so what you can do is you can take fatigue as an additional constraint and you can say, let's hold off on these duty hour regulations for the moment and let's actually have the science drive how long we should be flying when we become fatigued. And, we, and, and, and so that is a possibility you can do here. You can, make, you can replace the constraints of duty periods by one size fits all regulations from those that, that uh, are driven by the biology of fatigue as we know it from the science that we're developing put it all in the same mix, and then produce duty schedules that are going to be um, uh, meeting the integrity and, and, and the constraints of the environment, but at the same time, reduce fatigue the best possible way. And when you do that exercise, in certain circumstances, it actually turns out that you can produce schedules that preserve the integrity of the operation, that also make sure that fatigue is minimized, and yet, at the same time, can be at least as productive, if not more productive, than what you could otherwise accomplish. And I think that's an important, that's a win-win situation. We're not ready for that yet, that step, but that I think is what the future uh, has in, um, in store for us. And, um, and I hope that I can make a small contribution uh, to that future. With that, I would love to, there's a lot, there's a tremendous number of people and organizations that I have to acknowledge for all the work that's been done in, in the simulator study and, and before and after that. They're all listed here, I'm not gonna read them to you, other than to, uh, to say that I also wanna thank you all for your attention. And I'll turn it back to Kevin for maybe doing some Q&A or... Um, Do you just want to stand uh, that would be right fine. there? Yeah. Okay, he loves to stand. I'll, I'll go ahead and sit <laughs> like the commentator at it's the It's a great counter desk. Standing. Anybody have any further questions uh, about uh, what Hans has just uh, talked about? Any, anything to offer? Yes, sir. Give that a second. We're, He's working. We're, we're working the switches. Dear God. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Aaron Karp with Air Transport World. I know you said the results are preliminary um, and, and that there was a small difference. Um, with the caveat being that they are preliminary, could you elaborate at all on, on when, what, what the small difference was? Well, so workload has an effect, and in, 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 in cumulative workload increases fatigue in, in, in line with what we had uh, found in the lab. But I'm not ready to, to tell you exactly how much that effect, big that effect was because it's complicated in its interpretation, and I don't want to speak before my turn. Um, and, and do you know when the final results will be ready? <laughs> yeah, people have been asking me that question, and, and, and the scientific steering committee is waiting for me to wrap up the, the final report, and I have sort of made a, uh, a commitment that I would do that yesterday, but the real commitment is before the end of the summer. And, and any recommendations based on um, what you found so far on what pilots can do to, to m mitigate fatigue in, in multi-segment situations? Well, so that's, that's what the, the current phase, the, the, the last phase of the study that we're getting into right now is all about. And um, uh, there are certainly uh, things that are unique about the, uh, the multi-segment operation that I'm actually learning about right now. Um, uh, that, that, that open up opportunities and also challenges for applying certain countermeasures. But there are also a number of general principles that we have throughout aviation and throughout the entire 24-7 world 
that can be applied. And the question is, of course, what are the best countermeasures? When do you apply them? When do you, how do you do that most effectively? So um, I know from, from certain uh, other aviation environments that, that uh, when the situation allows it, if you can take a nap while you're on the ground during a break, that is a perfect, that's a great countermeasure uh, under certain circumstances. Some schedules in regional airline operations might also allow that. Some schedules will not allow it. That needs to be sorted out. Um, and there is a lot of work that a lot of people need to do to, to figure out how to, how to weigh the advantages and the disadvantages of such a countermeasure. Uh, a great one is caffeine. We all know about it, but actually if you use it judiciously, if you really think about how to maximize uh, the, uh, uh, the benefit that it can give you, uh, you can get a lot out of caffeine. Um, and I know that sounds like you already knew that. I, I know you already knew that, but it's, if it's managed properly, you can get more out of it still. Um, um, and, and, but, but ultimately, where I think this needs to go, but again, I'm sort of looking into utop utopia future, is that you manage the schedules in such a way that you, that you can still do the job that needs to be done, get the passengers that, that need to go where they need to go, um, but at the same time manage these schedules so that while, while maintaining the integrity of the operation and the productivity of the, of the operation, you find a way to make them at the same time less fatiguing, and that then helps to enhance uh, fatigue. I mean, the best countermeasure to fatigue is to not have it happen in the first place. We live in a society where that's not possible for various reasons. But if you can minimize it up front, you don't have to counter it as much uh, later on. So that's ultimately where I think this needs to go. But we're, we've got a lot of steps to take yet. Um, at the same time, of course, I have to say that many of the things that we talk about in, in fatigue risk management are already things that have been implemented in the industry as it is. Um, we, d we haven't necessarily labeled them as such. They're common sense, perhaps, or they are things that we just learned over, over the years without labeling it fatigue risk management. But many things that are done in the industry are already geared towards optimizing the, these, uh, minimizing these fatigue levels. And I think we should not forget about that, that this is an industry that's come a long way already. Thank you. If you take a look at it, Hans, with the mathematical model, it'll be used, as you say, somewhat in replacement of actually the, the regulation if you used it effectively and, and carriers then could use it to more effectively schedule their, their flights and what you're saying is that uh, they could then maximize their resources and move forward. Do you think that mathematical model could be used for the pilot themselves to where they were given a rotation or a series of flights and then the printout would come along with it that hey this is when I'm supposed to get tired and I would do something perhaps before I even go on the flight to mitigate that? Yeah, so it's funny. I, I had to turn my phone off because it would interfere with my microphone. Otherwise, I would have said, well, we can do that. And I was flipped. <laughs> and, and of course, then I would have screwed up because I always screw up on <laughs> my smartphone. But um, uh, th that's, that's, that is something we can already do today. I think yeah. how you implement it and how you implement it in a smart way is something that needs to be carefully managed. Um, uh, because you, what you don't want, as, as, I, as I tell my students, a person with one, one watch knows what time it is. But a person with two watches never quite knows which one's right. And, and of course, if you have uh, uh, ind industry-wide mathematical models and also your personal pocket calculator mathematical model say slightly different results, you get into trouble. So there is some management involved in doing that. But I think putting the ability in, in, in people's hands to self-monitor uh, uh, and self-mitigate fatigue would be a great step forward if it's managed properly. And I think it's, that's, that is within reach. We can technologically speaking do that already. Now the question is, how do you, how do you roll that out in a, in, a, in a responsible manner? But I think that can be done, and that would be great. Yeah, I think the responsible manner is a, a very key point. Barry? Uh, good afternoon. In your study there, uh, with, um, when you look at on-time performance requirements from airlines and, and the system, how did nourishment or the opportunity for proper nourishment enter into the study? In a simulator, if you're there for eight hours, uh, you know, are you dining on a uh, high calorie sandwich or, or do you have proper nourishment? Yeah, so we, we in, in the study itself, we provided meals in, in more or less the same way that, that pilots would do this normally. So they, they took a, a sandwich back from the hotel in the morning to, uh, uh, to the simulator, um, which they then, I, I, I believe most of them ate it during the pre-checking period, but I wasn't there to watch that particular part, although my students were. Um, uh, for lunch, they could go to the, uh, to the, to the airline, uh, or the, the, sorry, the um, uh, airport cafeteria, which was the, the cafeteria in the, in the training center. And I don't know what they did for dinner because they were back at the crew hotel already, but they, 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 they fed themselves the way they would normally have done 
uh, as close as we could mimic it in, a, in, a, in an uh, airline situation. I, I, what, I, what I think is, is behind your question, if I may, is of course, um, if you're not properly eating, if you're not properly feeding yourself, that is a factor that could also contribute to, to fatigue in and of itself, is an additional thing to, take, to think about. And, um, and, and this question came up yesterday when we had some discussions about this as well. It's an important point to make. As, uh, it goes back to what I said, is there are many factors that, that, that uh, feed in with, with fatigue in the operational environment that need to be taken into account all at the same time. One key factor in managing that, I think, is, is proper education. Tell people that it's just like you would tell our kids, that it's important to take good care of yourself and that that's a starting point for, uh, for that kind of stuff. But um, education, which is already implemented in industry pretty, pretty broadly, I, um, I, I happen to know, is a key factor in that, I think. Thank you. We're coming up on the end of uh, our hour. Uh, anybody else have any other questions or comments before we uh, adjourn for this particular session? Well, if not, I'd like to go ahead and uh, thank Hans for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you all.